And and is that part of the plan for how to spend the 1.2 over the next 18 months? Yes. All right. So if if I'm you and I'm thinking about this in a logical way, it seems to me come January, what we're going to do is relaunch our existing programs and start fresh. All right. I don't know when your fiscal year starts and ends. Is it is it when is your fiscal year start to end? It's a calendar year. Calendar year. So this is a great. So the timing is lined up for you to start fresh. You okay. can rename it. It's the same program. You can rebrand it. You can add whatever naming convention you want. But what I would spend time doing is not only prepping for a January 1st or January 2nd launch. I would strongly recommend with your staff thinking, start thinking about one uh, creative component to add to what you do. It's, it's almost like you're a chef in the, in the kitchen and you're looking to add just one spice that you know is missing. You don't know what it is yet. Right. Cause you have a great product and it sells out every time the restaurant opens. So now you and your sous chefs uh, need to figure out what is that special spice blend we need to add to the steak to really take it over the top. It can be something complex or something super, super simple. The reason why you want to think along those lines is because you don't want to break what you already have going because it's going. You got funded for it. Adding a spice or two isn't going to break the back of your staff either, but it gives you a fresh talking point with this new funding, and that's what you want to sell. Now, if you're starting January off with the same program pathways, the three that we talked about with a little spice, little salt, little pepper, uh, maybe a little oregano and some garnishes, right? And it looks like a brand new meal to your funders, but you know, it's, it's not, it's the same thing, just cook, it's like cooked a little bit different, right? Different pan, different little, you know, whatever you added to it. Start with that and start, you know, make sure you have your normal, successful top of the gear be, uh, launch. Where I now see personally what the opportunity will be is who are the partners serving in the other two pathways, specifically serving students who decide to go from high school to work. So these are students that graduate from high school and go to work at McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, Wendy's, Burger King, or wherever, Lowe's, Home Depot, and or students that graduate from high school and start families. Now, you want to justify this. Part of how you justify this is identifying providers who do work in those particular pathways. Um, it can be a variety of organizations, whether it's, you know, young adult mentoring programs, whether it's so, for example, I don't think you have this in your area, but I used to run a program called Strive based in New York, but has national uh, affiliates. We did soft skills training for justice involved youth. These are typically youth that may or may not have been sent to prison, but definitely have had run ins with the law. They graduate from high school and go straight to work. All they have to do, at least in our case, was to complete a soft skills training program, how to prepare for work, how to interview, prep their resume, whatever. And once they graduate, we help them get a job, high school to work. Um, The other people that kind of fit in that category would be uh, young women, um, young women who are having children, who are pregnant. Right. So there are programs that are doing this type of stuff. You got to figure out who they are. If you don't know who they are off the top of your head, here's a couple of um, breadcrumbs where you can kind of find who they are. Look at the major consistent funders in your region, your United Ways, your community foundations, your bank foundations. Go on their websites and start to look at the names of the organizations that they fund. Sometimes these foundations have them categorized, which Mm -hmm. makes your job easier. Worst case scenario, they don't have them categorized. So now you got to figure, you know, go on these people's websites and figure out what they do. From there, you look at their programs and you can see and determine, okay, this organization does this, this organization does that. I would get together a portfolio, a handful of folks from each of those two categories, high school to work, high school to family, have a conversation about what they're doing, what's working, what's not working, and talk about a funding opportunity that you have to bring on um, a couple of partners to kind of explore doing this work on a pilot basis. So I would think through what that amount's going to be. I would put together an RFP. I would put together an environment that encourages testing and piloting of an idea. 
I would filter out the best ideas that were submitted and I would manage this directly with other partners who are going to do the work directly, who are submitting reports to you based upon your $1.2 million funding expectations and obligations. That way, what's happening is that you're not getting an intern or a part-timer or a board member to do something that an organization who's already in this space that they can do it and they do it better. What you're trying to see is what's good about it, what can be better about it, and how can we scale that thing across the state? It's a different okay. mindset around partners. This also solves the problem of speed because if nonprofit X already does, you know, let's just use Strive. If I was in your area and I was doing this, when I was running programs, you came to me with that approach, I would be all over this. And I would have had a program already ready to go the moment you say, let's go. Okay. Because what's happening is that when that funding comes in from you to me, I'm just going to line you up with what I, what I already have going on right now. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. So this is what you want. You want partners who are already in this space, who are already doing stuff. I wouldn't start fresh with people who have no experience or organizations that have no experience. This also solves your staffing problem. This also solves your data problem because if you request proposals, you can have, just like any other grant, what's the data that backs up this this particular approach? And guess what? Now you've got your data and research that you can report out on when it comes time and talk about, hey, this is what we've learned. These partners can also be a part of your thought, uh, your think tank when you finalize your final report. When you go testify, you can invite them to be a part of that. So this also now becomes a conversation of who's the right fit. So it's not about just who can do the work, who has the staff, who has the money, but who do you get along with? Who do you think will not try to take the spotlight but will be a great partner and friend in this project? Not every organization that does the work is worth hiring or bringing on. So this is less about speed. This is less about where do I start because you already have a place to start. You own it. This is about who's doing what and who do I want to work with. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So in the lecture, we talked about, you know, well, if the program location is irrelevant because your partners are already going to have it, budget doesn't matter. You already got the money. Cash flow, that's been resolved. Um, I think lecture, a uh, uh, slide seven, looking at your strategic partners, I don't remember. I don't remember what I lectured about, but I'm pretty confident I said something <laughs> similar. <laughs> But I'm pretty confident I said something similar. I would focus on that particular conversation uh, or lecture. I would look at slide 10, service delivery, um, a second time, slide 12, program goals, um, and then managing your partners like any other program, having regular mm-hmm. report intervals where they're reporting up to you. I would not do it on the same schedule that you're on with your funders. So if you're on a quarterly report, you report to do the 15th. After the end of a quarter, so April 15th, July 15th, I would have your partner submit um, bi-monthly reports because you need that data in-house. And if they don't report or submit their reports, cut off funding, cut off the relationships, you know, start fresh because you control 1.2. That, that's the purpose of the leverage of you having this exclusive funding. Um, if necessary, you know, then you can think about bringing on an intern, part-timers, subcontractors. But given what I just shared with you, that's the least of your, you know, that's the least of what you need and much, much less you don't need a board member either. Okay. Cause I can't imagine a board member doing anything that we just talked about that would add value like the way we just added just right now. Unless you're going to tell no, me something different. Nope. All right. Um, I wrote down a note here. Um, it was a question to, to ask you and really it's a rhetorical question. Because you own three of the five pathways, you're going to find partners that may own the other two, whether it's one organization or two organizations or three, however you split this up. I want to put this uh, out there for you to think about. Because your your organization is a SME, are you familiar with the SME term, what that means? Subject matter expert, SME. And the the organizations you're going to subcontract out to are SMEs as well. Because you all are going to be SMEs, what you want to search for after everything is up and running are regular opportunities to nerd out. All right. So we already talked about launching your program January 1 with a little salt, a little pepper, a little garnish, maybe a fresh wine choice to go with that steak. Right. And, you know, um, a different ingredient imported from another part of the world. Right. You're going to do that. You want, you want your staff, this is where your intern comes in to start nerding out and studying the impact salt, that little pepper, that 
that uh, spice you added? How does that change things? Studying the nitty gritty because you already know the big picture data. Now you want to study the nuances. I would encourage you to do that same type of nerd session on a regular basis with your subs, having interns study the differences between what we offer and then what we offer that's slightly different. So an A-B interval, A, 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 B option. This is what marketing does, sales does. This is a great way to use your interns to nerd out on your behalf and submit regular reports. I got to tell you, if you take that simple approach, use what you got, subcontract out to other SMEs and use your, ner- your interns to nerd out on analyzing nuanced data, I'm telling you, it's going to it, – it's going to – what you'll notice, it seems small, but the divergence is going to eventually create this split that's going to show a difference. Can you see the difference? Because it started mm-hmm. out small, and it's going to eventually show a difference. It's going to be massive. This gap between here and here is what your your interns are going to study. It's going to blow your mind, and, and especially the mind of your funders. Lastly, I'll tell you this. One of the things, and I don't think I'll cover it, um, definitely not in this week's lecture, lecture, but let me just take a quick look, is – Messaging, I don't think, I don't know if I covered it. I know I address it at some point in our courses, but messaging that gap between what was and what is. What is the story that you want to tell about the differences your interns have identified from option A to option B? Yeah, I don't talk about marketing and messaging in this this course, but that's where you as a CEO want to spend your time interpreting that data. Telling that story, getting your funders excited, getting the legislature focused on the stories that you identify from the gap. When you are able to do that, it is mind blowing because we talked about fundraising the past couple of talks. You're going to be raising so much stupid money. It's not even going to make sense because you're telling a story of something you've been doing, but you just add it. A little salt, a little pepper, some garnish, <laughs> some squeezed oranges, a little lemon lime. <laughs> it tastes like a totally different.